Welcome to The Writer's Dream. This is a show where authors are able to talk about how they write their books, how they publish their books, and how they market their books. It's a writer's journey. You can find us on Facebook. Um, the page is called The Writer's Dream. And if you want to be on the show or you have a question, please message me on that Facebook page. We are also on the LTV website here. Just look at videos on demand and look for The Writer's Dream. We are on YouTube. Look for my name, Linda Maria Frank, and just click on my picture and my videos will come up. I've interviewed about 150 authors now. And if you are interested in writing or you're interested in good books and local authors, please look at those interviews. There's some very interesting stories and some very interesting advice. My guest today is Elaine Kiesling Whitehouse, and she has written a historical novel called Heart Stavern. And um, I am very interested in this because it's Long Island history and it's history. So tell us a little bit about Heart's Tavern before we get into being an author. Okay. <laughs> well, Heart's Tavern actually existed during the time of the uh, revolutionary period in Patchogue. Um, it was there, and people came and went there. Um, they would journey by horseback to the East End from Boston or New York City. And I used to drive by the plaque that was there on Montauk Highway that says, this is the site of Hart's Tavern. And I became very curious, what, what was Hart's Tavern? Mm -hmm. And I started looking around a little bit and talking to people. Um, I happened to be writing curriculum at the time about the American Revolution uh, in an in international school. So I thought, hmm, this is quite a, co a coincidence. And I really don't believe in coincidence. I, I think there's a reason for um, everything that happens. So I started doing some research about this period of time on Long Island, and particularly women at this time. Very, very little is written about women during the Revolutionary period, and yet they did tremendous work. They were essential. They were essential. They did the farming. They took care of the children. They they did everything. Well, while they the kept men they were as they did in World War II. They mm -hmm. kept everything That's, going while yes. the men were fighting. Right. They contributed so much, and the British actually occupied Long Island mm -hmm. for seven years, and it was a very trying time. Mm -hmm. um, they were quartered by force in people's homes. Mm -hmm. The story of Hart's Tavern is about four women, although most of the characters are women, but four women whose fate is sort of sealed at Hart's Tavern during this time. Um, they're different races, different ages, uh, they come from different backgrounds. And this, the story is about their struggle uh, during this time of the Revolutionary War when the British occupied Long Island. So um, I think, and you probably have thought of this, that a wonderful marketing ploy for you is this is the year of the woman, sort of. And oh, it's yes. this, mm -hmm. this, this, this wonderful upsurge of women into politics and government. Right, right. It's kind of our own little revolutionary war. I never thought of it that yeah, way. That's a wonderful mm -hmm. ploy to use mm -hmm. to say, here is a story about four yes. women in the original American Revolution. <laughs> right, right. So yeah. I, I would definitely uh, seize it's a on that. Very good idea. Thank you for that. Oh, That's you're a welcome. Great idea. Um, also, um, so your inspiration was really, and, and Long Island is is a mm -hmm. series of plaques. Yes. And I always yes. think in terms of wouldn't it be wonderful if if those buildings were still there? Because I live in Massapequa Park, and right by the firehouse is a plaque for the Jones Hotel. Right. And then I was in a, one of the delis in Massapequa Park, and there is a picture of the Jones Hotel. What a beautiful building. Yes. And I thought, wouldn't it be, it would be so nice if all these buildings were there. And I've lived uh, in that part of the island for about 50 years. Mm -hmm. And 
I remember some of the buildings before they were torn down. Yes. Well, Hart's so. Tavern, of course, disappeared long ago. Long ago. And mm. um, I don't want to give anything away, but, but mm -hmm. there is a, a part of the story that goes into that, what happens to Hart's Tavern, as well as what happens at Hart's Tavern. And um, some people didn't think that the tavern actually existed. I spoke to the uh, historian out in that area who said that perhaps it was just um, a legend that, Hor that George Washington had stopped there and was given a potato by a little boy named Johnny Hart. And George Washington said, oh, now I've eaten at Hart's Tavern. But in fact, his stopping at Hart's Tavern is in his journals. Um, he doesn't appear in the book, although other people do. Uh, Paul Revere makes an appearance, and of course we hear about Nathan Hale and um, others like that. So even though it's historical fiction, some of the characters woven into the story were absolutely real, including uh, some of the women. So tell us about the research. How difficult was it um, to do research on a building that isn't there anymore? Well. The building was really a figment of my imagination as far as what it looked like. Mm -hmm. um, I knew there were gardens and farms all around there, and I knew that since it was a tavern, they made their own beer and ale. Mm -hmm. um, so I needed to do research, for example, on how you make beer and how hops are grown for the beers. And I had no idea what hops even looked like. Do you know what they look like? Yes, because I, I belong to a garden club. And, okay. and the last meeting, a woman gave a talk about hops and yes. the use of hops. They're very interesting little plants. And so um, to answer your question about doing research, that was the joy of writing, because I love history. Mm -hmm. My husband loves history. Uh, we we both do it, we travel historically, let me put it that way. So that was a joy. Um, I, everything about it, I had to go to Boston to find out some things about the Freedom Trail. I went to Salem, Massachusetts a number of times to find out about the um, situation in the harbor with the, the blockade and the shipping mm -hmm. and so forth. And just to be in these actual sites to me was thrilling. And I tried to um, weave that into this local story about these four brave women who um, are the central it's point of the It's story. interesting because um, I wonder if there's something about people like you and me who mm -hmm. write about these things that what we see about history, that little breadth of, of history that we mm -hmm. manage to, we seize upon it. Yes. And I don't think everybody does that because I have a story too and I wrote um, The Mystery of the Lost Avenger. It's about mm -hmm. my main character's great grandmother who was a WASP, a woman's air service pilot during mm -hmm. World War II and she was a test pilot for Grumman. And my inspiration was going to the Cradle of Aviation oh, Museum yeah. and just wandering around because my, I was with my family mm -hmm. and seeing this plaque in front of this big airplane. Yes dedicated to the women who built them, tested them, flew them to the Pacific. Um, and I got into the airplane. I was able to climb into the airplane, and I was just seized by it. It was a wonderful feeling of, And wow, you know, Linda, history. I think in teaching, it's so important to keep this history alive. Mm -hmm. uh, not to get off the subject, but I think the test-driven education that we find today is is not helping the preservation of important history no, I and don't think so um, either. that also was one of my motivations as a teacher I wanted to bring history alive make it real that mm -hmm. people actually lived at this time and had all these different struggles uh, that they were able to overcome and and even to think about the, the red coats the Brits that were over here they were young men they didn't want to be here. They were away from their families. Mm -hmm. They had no place to live. They had to go and live in a tavern where nobody wanted them. And so to try to humanize people in this old place in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that's mm -hmm. the... Um, that's the challenge of writing yes. about history, is to try to recreate something that is long past. Yes. So, um, and and what was what did you think was the greatest challenge? Well, 
of writing these books. <laughs> to write this, these, books. this book, and I've written uh, another book and lots of other things, but just to find the time. <laughs> you know, teaching, um, having a family. I was also the editor of a, a summer newspaper, which is in a way how I met you, Linda, because of your book. <laughs> and um, so just a lot of work and still trying to find time. Mm -hmm. Mary Higgins Clark is such an inspiration. She's in her 90s and she's written I don't know how many yes. mystery books. Yes. She did that as a single mother of four young children. And I went to hear her speak one night in New York City. And she walked up to the stage with a crystal cane that she uses. And she said that she got up every day at 4 o'clock in the morning and wrote for two hours and then got her children ready to go to school. I have a friend who does that. She mm -hmm. gets up. Well, her kids are more grown now, but when her mm -hmm. children were younger, she would get up at 3 o'clock in yeah. the morning. There's no other way. I mean, the oh. biggest challenge is finding the time, which brings me to another point. Um, people are, have a lot of misconceptions about what it's like to be a writer. <laughs> people say, and they probably say this to you also, oh, I have such a great idea for a book. I, I really want to write this book someday. I, the idea is so great. It would be a great movie. Well, you have to write the book, <laughs> you know. In fact, somebody said, um, my friend has an idea for a book about 9-11. What should she do? Who should she contact? I said, well, when she writes the book, she can start to contact agents and publishers. Yes, so yeah. It, it, but that, yes, it is the writing of mm -hmm. the book. And mm -hmm. uh, I used to do a, um, a program in bookstores and libraries and yeah. on so you want it was called so you want to write a book yes. and it was the journey of self-publishing because many people will not write the book because they don't believe that they can ever get it traditionally published mm -hmm. and in the last 10 years or so yes. self-publishing has become uh, more respected let me put it yes, that way and I think it's a wonderful thing because mm -hmm. there are many worthy books mm -hmm. that would never get published otherwise and Hart's Tavern has led me to a traditional publisher. I now have a book that's in the final stages of pre-publication. Um, and that has led to another project down the road. So I think self-publishing is, is a wonderful opportunity. However, you have to get somebody to edit your book. Oh, absolutely. And, you can't and I just think turn it in the way. Yeah, <laughs> the way no. I, I think that um, your journey is very different from mine mm -hmm. in that you always, you shared with me that you always liked to write. Yes. I never liked to write. Oh. I, I became a writer because of my teaching, because I love to do curriculum. And um, I like to write stories for the kids just to amuse them. Oh, yes. I mean, yeah. I, I convinced kids that, uh, that uh, Isaac Newton invented the Fig Newton. <laughs> Of course, I disabused them of that <laughs> by the end of the year, but, but that was a fun thing for me, and that led me into writing. So um, I think you're probably more qualified than I am to talk about how well, you sit down and write that book. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, I started to write when I was about nine, and I was very much into the Maud Hart, Lovelace, Betsy Tacey series, and I wanted to be Betsy, and Betsy was a writer. I did everything Betsy did. In fact, <laughs> she used to jump out of trees to see if she could fly, so I jumped off the roof of the tool shed and almost broke my ankle. I did everything the way she did, and the series goes through her age, uh, teenage years, too. So I just started writing and giving the stories and poems to my poor <laughs> teacher. <laughs> they were I'm sure very lurid and, and um, <laughs> childish, but she was very understanding. And I just kept writing stories. Most of them were terrible. I wrote a book, um, oh, maybe 20 years ago. It was terrible, but I wrote it anyway. And then the research I did for that book helped me in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, my editor, uh, when I was working for a local newspaper, my editor of that paper said, nothing is wasted. Everything you write, everything you do is material. In fact, my new book, which is coming out in a few months, is dedicated to him. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's the process of writing. It's almost like um, ice skating. Yes, or playing the violin. Yeah, you just you, keep chipping you, away at that's it. That's right. Right? Yeah, and then eventually, um, 
I was ice skating in Central Park once, and, and a man came up to me and said, how do you skate backwards? And I said, the same way you get to Carnegie Hall. <laughs> <laughs> just practice, practice, practice. And, and yes. I think that it's true with writing. And my suggestion to people who want to write a book mm -hmm. is to take a writing course or join a writing group. Because mm -hmm. in a writing course, they will give you assignments with deadlines. Right. And also, try to write a little article for your local paper. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. try to do the great American novel right away unless you've got experience. Mm -hmm. And another thing, I, I really urge people to learn proper grammar, spelling, and punctuation. I know that sounds fussy, but it really does matter. And it to does buy matter. a copy of Strunk and White's Elements yes. of Style. Yes. It's a little book. It's Maybe yeah. you know half an inch thick, right. but it is so valuable for writers. Yes, because no matter what you write, it has to follow a format right. and a style. And even if you're writing dialect and you're writing slang in your dialogue, you still have to learn how to write dialogue. Absolutely. Because I've had my teacher friends who will read my books, they'll say, how do you write dialogue? Because they're used to... Uh, descriptive writing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what is it called, expository yes, writing. Yeah. And I said, it's just listening to people talk and, right. and writing down how people talk. That's, uh, because I see my books like movies. Mm -hmm. They are, in my mind, like a movie. So Scenes, then the dialogue right. became easy. But I really didn't know the format, mm -hmm. the grammatical format of it, yeah. well, I until writers, I took that writing course. Writers have to know that. Yes. I mean, yes. To be taken seriously or, or mm -hmm. to get paid to write, you have to know that. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's, that's the first step. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, uh, you know, you don't have to pay to take a writing course. No. You can go to the library yes. and join mm -hmm. a writing group, or there are several writing groups on Long Island, and you'll learn so much from those. And the, the camaraderie also of, mm -hmm. of being on the same journey as these other people at various stages along the way. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's very good to do that. And also, if you join a group and they are critical 